Um, I, I will really quick here. I'm just gonna click on this and share. So you can see, uh, here's my family here uh, that DK mentioned. That's my wife, my Krisha, and then our boys, um, Elijah and Paviel. Uh, Elijah is the 17 year old, but he's the, the tall one in the family. So that's, um, that's our family. We're here in Roseville, Minnesota. Uh, which is a it's a little area right in between uh, Minneapolis and St. Paul, and so um, that's where we're at. It's been an interesting month here um, in Minneapolis, as it has been in in many places. And so uh, I'm really grateful that you guys I know are going through uh, a crown that will last together, and I'll. I'll tell you the the challenges, of course, is that um, it's not easy to pursue cultural humility. That it, you know, Paul even says as much um, when he says in First Corinthians nine twenty two, "I become all things to all people." He's really talking about cultural humility there. And then the very next passage he talks about in verses twenty four to twenty seven, he says. I go into strict training for this. It's not going to come easy. It's hard work. And he says, I I make my body my slave to be able to do this. And so um, I think that tonight we're talking about week two uh, of the the devotional book. And I know last week you guys focused on uh, being image bearers. And what's interesting is the really the ideal, when God gives a picture of his ideal gathered people in in heaven and in the future, we see in Revelation chapter 5, verse 9, it describes people from every tribe, every language, every people group, and every nation, that that is the picture of God's image-bearing people who have been formed to the image of Christ. It's a diverse people uh, from every nation. We've become used to that, but this was a really radically new concept in the first century to have a way of life that somehow was going to gather everybody like this into one identity group was, um, was new and it was novel and it was radical. Um, as, as you saw last week, God made human beings uh, in his image to be his image bearers, both male and female. And the the poetic picture that's being given to us in Genesis 1 is in the ancient world, they would build temples quite often, and they would have uh, inauguration ceremonies for these temples, and they lasted seven days quite frequently. And so the number seven became associated with a temple inauguration. And oftentimes on the sixth day of that inauguration, they would take the statue of the God and place it in the temple. And what that really, um, (coughs) excuse me, what that indicated was the image of God was now in the creation of its temple and it was mediating the rule and the will and the, you know, what that God wanted was now being uh, conducted through that statue. And that's the imagery that Moses uses in Genesis chapter 1, as he said. But the difference is God's temple is not a temple made by human hands. It's the entire creation. It's the cosmos. And, and so it uses that seven-day imagery. And then on the sixth day, God also placed a statue, an image, the Hebrew word is Salem, uh, in his temple. But instead of being a statue, uh, it's human beings, male and female. We are the representatives of God. And what the Bible pictures is that God's original intent for his creation was to be filled, the entire creation, with his image bearers, that were conducting his image and representing him, caring for his creation around the world and being in unity with one another. But human beings also, he he gave us the choice. And we immediately, as we see with Adam and Eve, 
human beings chose our own will. We decided instead of God's will, instead of reflecting and representing his will, we'll exalt our own, which really, when you think about it, is what sin is. Sin is doing our own will instead of God's, right? And so that is destructive to the creation. It divides the creation. And it breaks it down into division, violence, separation, rebellion, grouping, tribalism, all of those things. And then we fast forward to chapter 11, and human beings do something different this time. They continue to rebel against God, but they unite in their rebellion. And so human beings say, we're going to stay together. We're not going to listen to God's will. We're going to do our own will, but we're going to do it in unity. And in a weird sort of way, that's the Tower of Babel story in Genesis 11. In a weird sort of way, it it tells us the power of unity. Because unity is so powerful that God will now work against his own ideal for humanity Because he says, man, if they are united in rebellion against me, that's trouble. Look out, because unity is that powerful. And so God separates the humanity into the nations, into people groups, and sends us on our way. And ever since that time, humanity has been trying to put ourselves back together, some through kind means, some through conquering the world. However we've tried to do it, we have failed. Because when we stand in a wedding and say, what God has put together, let no man tear asunder, the opposite is also true. What God has torn apart, we will not be able to put back together. So God separates us into groups. But he comes to Abraham in the very next chapter, chapter 12. And he says, Abraham, this is not my ultimate will. I have chosen you and your descendants to one day gather the nations again. That's the message he keeps giving to Abraham. I'm going to bless the nations. I'm going to bring them back together. And that's the great promise that really hangs throughout the Old Testament. In Isaiah 2, we think of that great prophecy where he says, in in that day the mountain of the Lord will come and the nations will stream to the mountain of the Lord. In Isaiah 66, 18 through 21, It uses a language, and God says, one day I will gather the nations. And all throughout the Old Testament is this promise to gather the nations. This is what God plans to do. And then, of course, we ask, well, what's our mission now? If our purpose is to bear God's image, as we looked at last week, um, what is our mission? And I'm going to maybe throw you a bit of a curveball here and say our mission is not to make disciples. In fact, Jesus didn't tell us to go make disciples. Now, that might sound shocking to you. And you might go, wait a minute. I've got Bible studies that say different. I did them. I give them with people all the time. I know the Great Commission. I know what Jesus said. He said, go make disciples. But hear me out. What if I were to tell you, after this Zoom meeting, I'm going to go shoot my sons? What would you think of that? Oh, see, I didn't finish the sentence. I'm going to shoot my sons a text and remind them of what they have going on tomorrow. See, the second part of that sentence is really important, isn't it? And it redefines the first part. When I stop halfway through, it sounds like a different sentence. It sounds like a crime. I'm going to shoot my sons. In the same way, Jesus didn't say, go make disciples. He said, go make disciples of all nations. That's the mission. And you can't separate the two. If you separate out the two, we come up with something very different. We come up with a mission that is simply growth-focused, And it really doesn't make a difference how we do it. Evangelical Christianity in the 1980s came up with the idea called the HUP, which is the homogenous unit principle. And the idea was simply this, that if you create a church that is aimed at one demographic, 
one race, one age group, whatever it may be, and cater to the needs of that group and, you know, hit the cultural preferences of that group, that your church will grow faster. And guess what? They were absolutely right. And they came up with mega churches all over the place where everybody was pretty much culturally or ethnically or socioeconomically uh, very similar in the same category. Because it's easy to be around people who are all like you and tend to share the same experiences and think the same way, or at least it's easier. And so those churches grew very quickly. But they were only looking at half the sentence, go make disciples. That's not the mission that God gave us. Part of the mission itself is to make disciples of all nations. Jesus kept hinting at this all throughout his ministry. He would get in trouble with the Jews all the time. He kept telling stories about the Gentiles coming in and sitting at the table of Abraham and uh, all these stories about non-Jewish people uh, doing God's will. And it was puzzling to them. It's not what the Jews were expecting. No one was expecting that. They thought reading the Old Testament and all these promises of God bringing in the nations, that what he meant was God would come through the Messiah and conquer all of the pagan nations and humble them before Israel, and then would be sort of the resurrection, the end of time as we think. And somehow in the resurrection, he'd let the other nations in at once they were humbled. But there was no concept in their minds of being in the present age and that somehow including all of the nations as one family, living together as one people. Uh, they didn't see that coming. And so Jesus redefined that for him. So when he stands there and he says, go make disciples of all nations, we see in Acts that they're still questioning before Jesus leaves. They're like, um, so is the kingdom going to come at this time? Like, are we, are we getting to that resurrection part? Because how are we going to be? See, they didn't understand how to do it, right? Uh, they struggled with it. We read Acts, and they, they were, were like, how could they not get it? Jesus said, go make disciples of all nations. Why are they not just running out to the nations? Because it was so out of the box for them, and it was so challenging. They had so many things to work out that it really becomes one of the main themes of the New Testament is how are they going to work this out? How are Jew and Gentile going to live together? Um, so no one envisioned a people of God in the present age that included all this diversity. And it, it did take many years for the church to work it out. You see, Peter with Cornelius, he's all hesitant, like, wait, how's that going to work? I don't, you know, um, Gentiles in the family, I mean, they're not even Jews, and they don't even have the same culture as we do, and they're unclean and all that. And then you have Antioch, and Antioch was an amazing place. Antioch understood the mission to gather the nations. Antioch was one of the most diverse cities in the first century, but it was marked by ethnic division and riots and violence. The ethnic groups did not get along. And into that that chaos comes a very diverse church preaching the gospel of the of king jesus gathering the nations and i think what happens what luke is trying to tell us about antioch when he says the disciples became christians first at Antioch, or were called christians first at antioch is the people of antioch never saw anything like that they didn't know what to call this group because they weren't any one ethnic group. They weren't divided like everyone else is. So they gave them a social name. They called them Christians. And when Peter came and saw that diversity, he was even blown away by it. He was, he was taken up with it. He was a part of it. And then the Jews come from, Ju from Judea, and he immediately backs off of it. And so Paul challenges them and says, Peter, you, in our terminology of today, you are being a bigot right now. You are missing the gospel. And that's the thing. The gospel is 
the gathering of the nations. In Galatians chapter 3, Paul says, when God came to Abraham and announced that all nations would be blessed through your descendants, he was announcing the gospel ahead of time. As we'll see in a minute in Ephesians 3, he says that the uh, this gathering of the nations is the mystery of Christ. So it's it's pretty amazing because it's so challenging. And the early church could have split time and again. In Acts chapter 6, we see the Hebraic Jews and the Hellenic Jews having division. What are they going to do there? They could have split and had two different churches. But the church leaders said, no, that's not what the gathering of the nations is about. That's our mission. It's not to just grow. It's not to make life easy. It's to face this challenge and stay together. They faced it in Antioch. They faced troubles, uh, ethnic and cultural troubles in Galatia. That's why the whole letter of Galatians is written, because the church was about to split apart culturally and ethnically. It's why the letter to Romans was written, because the church was about to split apart and break up the gathering of the nations. In Corinth, they were about to split apart because of social divisions. And he says, that's not the gathering of the nations. Uh, in Ephesus, he reminds them of the importance of it. They could have split, but they refused because they understood that God's call was to gather the nations. It's not something nice to do. It's not a great extra. It's not like, hey, our church is cool because we're diverse. It's not a cultural trend. When people, you know, when we start talking about race and culture and how we're going to come together and how we're going to stay together and how we're going to deal with these issues. Number one, we're very much following in the footsteps of the early church. Um, over 30% of Paul's letters deal with teaching the church how to bring the different races and culture groups together. But number two, please don't ever think when we talk about these issues that we are somehow following the world that we're following the trends of the world because they all want to talk about those things. They got that from the church. They stole diversity from King Jesus. That was never thought of before Jesus. So please don't think ever that this is a worldly issue. We should be leading the way. We should be mentoring the culture and how to be diverse, how to bring people together. Because it cannot happen apart from Jesus, but there's a lot of work to do on our part. But it's God's mission. And I want to just look at one book of the Bible in the, in the last few minutes here um, today. So turn over to Ephesians chapter 1. And I'm just going to race through the first few chapters of this and You'll go through this a little more in detail in if, if you're going through the crown that will last devotional. And so you'll see this throughout the week. Um, but Paul begins his letter and he says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus. Now he goes on for the next several verses to describe what they all have in common in Christ. He sets up and says, in Christ, we have all these things that bring us to unity. We all have them. We all share in them. There, there is not, you know, the Jews have this and the Gentiles have that. We are all the same in Christ Jesus. He's really setting them up for what he's going to do in the rest of the letter. And then he says in verse 15, he says, for this reason, Ever since I heard about your faith in, Lord, in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. Now, what we've got to understand is when Paul says they are all God's people, your love for all God's people, he's not just using that generically and saying, hey, I'm glad you love everyone. Everyone you see you love. He's making a reference here to the, this mission of gathering the nations. And he's acknowledging the challenge of it. And he said, I'm so excited that you are committed to this love for 
all God's people and understanding that all people are God's people and you're bringing them back together, that that you're bringing them into the inheritance, into the family. You're, you're doing this work that is challenging. And in, in chapter two, he continues that thought. And I wish we could go through every verse here, but let me skip ahead to verse 11. And you probably know this passage well, but he's still on this topic of their love for all God's people. And he says, therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands. Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise without hope and without God in the world. You are not part of God's family, is what he's saying. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. You've been brought into God's family. And here's where he really starts hitting home. For he himself is our peace. He is the only one that will bring peace to the nations. Human beings have been trying to do it through war, through nice means, through everything else, conquering the world, whatever, and have failed for hundreds and thousands of years. He is our peace, who has made the two groups one. And he's talking of Jew and Gentile there, but, it, you know, however you want to split that up, he has brought all the nations, all the ethnic groups, all the cultures together into one people, which is incredible. I got to find out where I left off. Okay, where did we leave? Uh, he's made the two groups one, right? Um there we go. Okay. Um, well, I'll just pick up in verse 14 here. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one, and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. Now, Paul's point about the law here is this. The purpose of the law was to separate Israel from the nations until the Messiah could come. This is what he explains in Galatians 3. And so he says, now understand his thinking here. If God's mission is to gather the nations, but the purpose of the law is to bring the Messiah by separating Israel from the nations, then in order for God's mission to carry on, the law must be set aside because it by nature separates, but God's whole mission is to bring together. So the law was really good for a temporary purpose. The law is like a ship that takes you across the ocean, but you don't keep dragging it with you when you get to dry land. You say, thank you very much, ship, and you move on to the next phase. The law got to the Messiah, but now the Messiah gathers the nations. So people who say we want to keep following the law, they will break down God's mission because the law divides the nations. And so he says, this is what God has done in Christ. And verse 16, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who are near. For through him, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently. You are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of his household. And he goes on and says, we're being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. What an incredible uh, description of the gathering of the nations. This is our mission. This is what we have to be about. Diversity is the key to God's uh, declaration to the world, this is what I'm doing. And, and watch what he says. He says, and let's go on to chapter 3 now. Because a lot of times we just read chapter 2 and we go, oh, man, that was great. And we, we don't connect it with chapter 3. 
He says, for this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, surely you've heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is the mystery made known to me by the revelation. Now, the way they use mystery in the first century is it's something that was previously concealed that's now being revealed. So he says in verse 4, in reading this then, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to people in other generations, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body and shares together in the promise in Christ Jesus. He says, don't you see it? God has finally fulfilled his promises. He's gathering the nations. He's doing it. He's torn down the wall of hostility. Don't you dare build it back up. Don't you dare let your cultural differences or culture or things you know from society that can get in there and separate us don't do it be humble drop your national allegiances your political allegiances your ideological allegiances don't let them get in the way of god's gathering the nations he says i became a servant of this gospel by the gift of god's grace given me through the working of power although i am less than the least of all the lord's people this grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this ministry, which was for ages was kept, for ages past was kept hidden in God who created all things. Look at this, verse, 11, verse 10. His intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities and the heavenly realms. It's challenging to be a diverse church. It would be easier right now to be an all-white church or an all-black church. It would be easier to give sermons. It would be easier to address things in society, but that is not the mission that God gave us. And if we allow divisions to get in there, then we are shutting off the world from seeing the manifold wisdom of God. That's how serious this is. He says he's accomplished this in Christ Jesus our Lord. In him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, which are your glory. Let me say this. I don't think Paul would say, therefore, ignore uh, mistreatment and act like it doesn't happen. Don't talk about these issues because they might be divisive. Paul goes the other way. He says, oh, we're going to talk about these and we're going to work it out and we're going to figure it out. And in 1 Corinthians 12, he says, if you have a group of people that are marginalized and oppressed and mistreated out in the culture, then we take special honor in the church to make sure that they find honorable treatment, that those that those differences are wiped out in the church. We don't ignore them. We don't say they're not there. We put in the work in God's kingdom to be an alternate society. So please don't read in that I'm saying, let's gloss over things and pretend like there's not challenges in the world. I know there are. And we have to talk about it because this is the mission that God's given us. We can't take the easy way out. Now, I want you to see in verse 14, He's still continuing this thought of the mission to gather the nations because he says, for this reason, everything you just said, the mystery of Christ, for this reason, I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and earth derives its name. All people groups come from God. I pray. We often separate this prayer as though Paul is just talking generically now. We haven't followed the context. He's still talking about the gathering of the nations. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's holy people right? To grasp how wide, 
and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. How are we going to grasp how long and high and wide and deep? By being part of this gathering of the nations, by putting in the work and loving all of God's holy people. And to know that his love surpa- this love surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now, he's still on the gathering of the nations. Now, to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is wor- at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. And a- amen. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of the peace, because there's one body, one Spirit, just as you were called one hope when you were called one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. He says, we've got to fight for this unity because it's God's wisdom for the world. And here's the thing. I can't prove that this is 100% what's being talked about here. But Paul writes this letter to the church in Ephesus uh, somewhere in the mid-50s. Most scholars believe that the book of Revelation is written somewhere around the mid-90s. If they're correct, it's a a full generation later. And in chapter 2 of Revelation, Paul writes, or I'm sorry, John writes, uh, and it says to the angel of the church in Ephesus. And he says, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hands and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you've tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You've persevered and have endured hardships for my name, and you've not grown weary. This sounds like a great church. They've held a true doctrine. They've held to God's word. They are enduring persecution and hardships. They are faithful to God. They've not grown weary. It doesn't sound like their problem is between them and God. So what could he be talking about when he says, yet I hold this against you, you have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you've fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. Could it be that part of the love he's talking about there is the love that he's talking about in the book of Ephesians, the love for all God's people? Could it be that they had let that go and had not kept that as a priority? Oh, they kept their doctrine. They kept their faithfulness. They persevered. But could that be part of it? That's something to think about. We can't say 100% sure. But God's mission for us has been to gather the nations. That is the heart of the gospel um, and it is, it's going to be really huge as we move forward in the crown that will last book, uh, because the gathering of the nations has to be our motivation. It's our why. Why do we do what we do? Why do we deal with all the challenges and the hardships that are going to come from being a diverse church? We've got to hang on to this part, that this is God's heart. It's what he wants for humanity. It is the mission that he's given us. Uh, let's hang on to it and put in the work. Amen. Um, we'll stop there and I'll turn it over to DK. All right. Well, uh, thank you, Michael. That was, that was awesome. That was a lot of really good scripture. And, um, I think that you, that you made your point biblically and very, very well about the importance of gathering the nations together and how that is actually the heart of God. I have a couple questions that I want to ask. I want to remind everybody, if you have a question, please message me privately and just send your question in real quick. But we have time for for a couple here, so I'm going to go ahead um, and start. My first question, Michael, and then we can go ahead and put the spotlight back on you, is um, why do you think tribalism is prevalent in the church? 
That's the question. Why do you think tribalism is prevalent in the church? Well, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I, I mean, first of all, um, tribalism is part of fallen human nature. Um, we've seen it from the beginning of sin on through. And, and racism is a form of tribalism. You see it everywhere in the world. When we do workshops in the United States, we call them race and culture. When we do them in Africa, we call them tribalism and culture. It's the same, same principles. Um, why is it prevalent in the church? Um, I think the thing is, is there's several reasons for that. Number one is, you know, uh, I've heard people, and it's very puzzling to me, will say, well, you know, we don't have prejudice in the church, or there's not racism because I gave that up when I became a disciple. I went in the waters of baptism, and that was the end. Well, really, uh, you know, I ask people, I'm like, how's that, how'd that, how's that working for your pride and your lust? And, your, you know, those things didn't just go away, um, at least for me. Maybe they do for the disciples in Long Beach, but I continue to have to work on pride and lust and those things. So why would I not have to work on these instincts of tribalism, these instincts of bias that have really been conditioned into us, um, you know, from society? We, they're, they're there. And so, um, and they can be in, in anybody. And, I, you know, I, I'm open about this because I, I think it's important to name it and talk about it uh, because the world right now is really like, you know, bias, prejudice has become the unspeakable, unforgivable sin in the world. We will, you know, you, you're guilty of it and we will own you. You're canceled. You're done. We don't want to take on that attitude in the church. Um, and so, you know, I've been with my wife for 25 years. I'm raising two young black men in the world. And yet, there was uh, a couple of years ago, I dropped a friend off at the airport at 3 a.m. Um, I stopped to get some gas at 3 a.m. in the morning. Two white guys walk by me as I'm pumping gas. I didn't even think about it. And then a minute later, I heard a door open on the side of this building that was next to the gas station. And two black guys came out. And for just a minute, my whole body tensed up. And I was like, ooh, am I, am I in danger? And then I thought, wait a minute. I don't know these two white guys from Adam. I don't know if they're a threat to me or not, but I assumed that they weren't without even thinking about it. And here are these two guys. I didn't know them either. And I spent my whole life speaking on, you know, racism and culture and these kind of things and bias. And, and yet there it was. How did it get there? Because I don't know those two guys either. See, it's been programmed in from the society around. And so we have these biases. Don't deny it. When people are like, I'm not racist at all. I'm not biased at all. And that's what they really mean. Cause racist is really, racism is really a system of oppression. What people really mean is I'm not biased or prejudiced. Of course you are. That sounds as ridiculous as somebody saying, I'm not prideful at all. Well, guess what we all think when you say that we know that you are. And so that's one part of it. The other thing is, I think, where it can come into the church is um, we don't talk about it. We don't deal with it. We're not honest about it. And so because of that, we are going to reflect and bring in with us all the sin and inequities of the world. I mean, imagine if, if you have a marriage and you don't deal with all the sort of messed up things you got from your parents or you know, your previous life for if you were abused and you've got issues with that, you don't talk about that, that's going to come into your marriage. It's going to affect your marriage. And so when we don't deal with these things of the world, because, well, it might be divisive or it might be bumpy. Yeah, it might be. Just like when I talk, when my wife and I have real serious conversations, sometimes it's bumpy, but we have to do that and get over those bumps. And, and you know, if uh, in our country, there's 400 years of inequitable treatment uh, of people. That's, that's a reality. I used to be a history teacher, so 
uh, if you don't believe that statement, hit me offline and I'll give you 400 years of history uh, of the reality. It's not just something that ended 150 years ago. It's continued. And that's it results in education gaps, economic gaps, housing gaps, uh, health care gaps, you name it. And, but it's sin. I'm not trying to demonize any one group. That's just what happens when we tribalize because of sin. And so those things are out there. Well, if we don't deal with them in the church, then they're just going to reflect, even though we're not doing anything intentionally, we're just reflecting the inequities out in the world. So we're going to have to deal with those things. That's what Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 26. We've got to deal with these things and counteract what is going on in the world so that it doesn't come into the church. And that's what we haven't spent enough time honestly doing, um, is we're, we're tiptoeing through the tulips, singing tunes, thinking the birds are tying bows in our hairs, in our hair, because that's what happens when we're disciples. But somehow that only happens when it comes to bias and prejudice. But all the other sins we have to keep working on. So let's just be real and say we've got to have these discussions. We've got to talk about these things. We've got to learn this process. And that's the, the humbling part. It's not to shame anybody. It's not to give anybody guilt. I don't feel guilty about what happened 100 years ago, 200 years ago, 50 years ago. But I, as a Christian, if for no other reason, as a Christian, I bear responsibility to deal with those things and bring God's justice into the world and especially the church.